السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعدوان إلى عم الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسلم كثيرا want to welcome you all back to Quran 30 for 30 our first repeat back by popular demand Sister Tasneem Al-Qiq Alhamdulillah is with us uh, tonight and I um, want to remind everyone just before I get started inshallah ta'ala that we have officially launched our last 10 nights campaign inshallah ta'ala so if you click the link and you put in the sadaqa amount that you'd like to distribute over the last 10 nights remember that the amount that you put in will be the nightly amount inshallah ta'ala and bin ta'ala it's a way of catching laylatul qadr and also supporting the work here at yaqeen institute so may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and reminding you that we will have our last 10 nights telethon inshallah ta'ala our finished strong telethon on may 13th inshallah ta'ala from 3 p.m to 8 p.m uh, Eastern, the end of which will be a du'a that we can all join in, inshallah ta'ala, as we go into the first of the last 10 nights, which will be, uh, that will be the 21st night of Ramadan, bi'idhna nahi ta'ala. So we get into just 17, inshallah ta'ala, and subhanAllah, today, as I was preparing for, for this, um, it gave me a whole new perspective on it, and that's been the beauty, I think, of hearing the reflections from Sheikh Abdullah and from our guests every night, uh, as we're sort of telling the story of Islam through the Qur'an in this particular way. Surah Al-Anbiya, this surah of the prophets and it comes at the end of the meccan period similar to a lot of these surahs but it doesn't focus on one prophet it gives this whole scope of all of the prophets and in fact it mentions 17 prophets by name in the surah and it gives you a snapshot of each one and it kind of gives you the end result of each one of those prophets da'wah so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making the way out for all of those prophets sort of the final relief that came to each one of those prophets. And the only one whose life we get, you know, uh, some, some some depth with is Ibrahim alayhi salam, the journey with his father and with the idols in particular, where the Prophet sallallahu is also in a similar situation now leaving Mecca, not having been able to convince his people at that moment due to the arrogance that came from uh, the elites of Mecca, that the idols were of no benefit to them. So the rest of the prophets, you're kind of getting a snapshot of each one of them. And we'll talk about how that plays out um, in the surah. Uh, the surah starts off with that the reckoning that people have been pushing off, it's coming towards them and they are continuing to push themselves into heedlessness, meaning Allah has given them enough of a chance. And of course, the hisab that Allah is talking about is the day of judgment, the way that the reckoning um, is coming towards uh, towards them. Now, at the end of Surah Taha, which is the previous surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the way people are disoriented on the day of judgment. The disbelievers are disoriented on the day of judgment. Until the end, Allah talks about people that have uh, a constricted life because of their rejection and because of their arrogance. And then they're raised up on the day of judgment uh, blind. And then they, they complain. Why did you raise me up blind? I used to be able to see. Allah gives us the scene of them running around on the day of judgment, looking for an out. And Allah is saying that the out has been here the whole time, but you haven't been taking that out. Now, the, the nature of Surah Al-Anbiya is consoling the Prophet Sallallahu that you are not the first one to go through this. And that's actually something that is very powerful here because you think of the, some of the claims that were made against the Prophet Sallallahu And the nature of those claims is similar to the claims that were made against prophets that came before. So, for example, when they said, why can't you do some sort of superhuman, immortal thing? Why don't you bring the angels and, and pull off these feats? Allah subhanahu wa says in verse 8, that those that came before, the messengers that came before, were not immortal bodies that didn't need food. They were just like you. Remember the claim against the Prophet ﷺ that what kind of prophet is this that walks in the marketplace, that uses the restroom like we do? Allah is saying all of the prophets that came before were full human beings, and you are not an exception to that. And on top of that, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa says in verse 25, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِن قَبْلِكَ مِن رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَعْبُدُونَ Never did we send any messenger before you to whom we did not reveal, there is no God but me, so serve me alone. So both you in your nature and the call that you have in its nature is exactly the same thing as the prophets that came before you. And you are going through the same trials that they are going through. 
And this is probably one of the most beautiful uh, set of ayat here in terms of consoling a person. You know, Surah Yusuf is consoling in its entirety. But if you go to Surah Al-Anbiya and you really pay attention tonight, inshallah, in your tarawih or when you're reading from verse 41 uh, onwards, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ اسْتُهْزِهَا بِرُسُلٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِكَ فَحَاقَ بِالَّذِينَ سَخِرُوا مِنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ and other messengers before you were mocked. They also went through the mockery and the slander that you went through. But those who scoffed at the messengers were overtaken by the same punishments that they had mocked. Then Allah talks about the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, how he was thrown into a fire, but Allah protected him. Then Allah talks about Lut alayhi salam, how he was turned away by his people, rejected by his people, and his people were destroyed in a very unique way, but Allah subhanahu wa entered him into, into his mercy and wrote him from the Salihin, from the righteous. Then Allah talks about Nuh alayhi salam, Shaykh al-Anbiya, the, the, the elder of the Anbiya, the prophets, 950 years of da'wah, of primarily rejection, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saving him. Then Allah talks about Dawood alayhi salam, and Sulaiman alayhi salam, and Ayyub alayhi salam. So this is one of the two parts of the Qur'an where you have the story of Ayyub alayhi salam. Ayyub who was tested with enormous tests in every way possible, his health, his wealth, his family, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, rescued him as he turned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah reminds the Prophet sallallahu last about who? About the first Prophet that we started off with, Yunus alayhi salam, who was swallowed by the whale and who supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his, in, in his trial and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rescued him and pardoned him. So it's, it's like a, a full string of prophets, 17 prophets all at once saying to the Prophet Sallallahu every prophet that came before you went through what you're going through to some extent. And the, the claims, the substance of the claims that were used against them that, oh, this is for personal gain. Oh, gain. Uh, this is mock. This is uh, sorcery. This is so that you can take power. This is to divide the people. This is this. This is that. Uh, why, why are you not superhuman? Why don't you show us this? Why don't you show us that? It happened with every single prophet before you, so surely it will happen to you as well, O Prophet of Allah. And you can think of the comfort that that gives to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that you are in the league of, of Jesus, Moses, Noah, Abraham, all of them, Alayhi uh, Wasallam, peace be on to them, all who went through this. And this is just the continuation of that. But Allah says in all of their situations, look what the end result was. And so the end result for you will be the same. Now let's go to Surah Al-Hajj. The first two verses of Surah Al-Hajj continue in response to the coming of the hour. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the beginning of Surah Al-Anbiya, a snapshot of what happens on the day of, or the idea of the day of judgment coming very quickly and being prepared for the reckoning. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the believers as if those people are no longer even uh, you know, uh, uh, worthy of being addressed exclusively. But instead, here's a message to all of mankind. <inaudible> that fear the wrath of your Lord. Indeed, the, 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 the shaking, the trembling of the hour will be an awesome thing. It will be a, it will be a, a severe thing. Um, verse 5, Allah calls us in Surah Al-Hajj to consider our own creation. So Allah talks about how we have been made from turab, from dirt, and then uh, transfer, trans, transfer to a drop of, uh, of sperm, nutfa, and then uh, from the clot of uh, blood, alaqa. So Allah talks about the different ways that we come to be, from dust to, to the drop of fluid, to the lump of flesh. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts to go through the way that we go in our mother's wombs and the way that we reach the stages that we reach. If you read Surah Al-Anbiya, it's really reflecting on the creation of the heavens and the earth. Here, there's a, a reflection on the creation of man. So for us to reflect within ourselves, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in various parts of the Qur'an that we will show them our signs in the heavens and the earth, بالآفاق وفي أنفسهم, in the creation around them and even in themselves until they come to that conclusion of faith. But here's what I really want to get to. I think, Shaykh Abdullah, you're talking about verse 11 today, right? Yeah. So, you know, there's a test that's coming, okay? And the believers have now been pushed to their edge. Surah Al-Anbiya, the first half of it is Makki, and then at verse 26, it becomes Medina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, some people worship a lot on an edge. When the test gets too severe, they jump off, and that's what Shaykh Abdullah is going to be talking about. The believers have been pushed to an edge, and now they have migrated with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I want to call you your attention to just 
One beautiful thing about this, because I'm sure you've heard these ayats about Hajj many times. Allah is telling us from the very beginning of the Quran, the, the, the dream of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the dream of Abraham will be fulfilled. How will it be fulfilled? By his noble son, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, purifying the house that he built for his worship and reestablishing Tawheed monotheism in that place and by extension in the whole world. And the way that the last, the last days of, of the world play out is Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, peace be upon him, making his way saying, la bayk Allahumma la bayk, to establish Tawheed once again, to establish monotheism in the place that Ibrahim alayhi salam set up as a place of the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So Hajj is the focal point, right? Mecca is the focal point. When, when it is purified, then that is a sign of the purity to the world. What is the first thing that Allah addresses here? And what's the mindset of the believers? And I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine being a Muslim who grew up in Mecca your entire life. You've seen the Kaaba day and night your entire life with its idol worship. And now is the first time you've been run out of Mecca. You're in Medina and you don't know when you're ever going to see the Kaaba again, if you'll ever see it again and if it will be in a state of Tawheed again. Can you imagine the hardship that the Muslims felt in Medina, how much they yearned for Hajj and Umrah, for the Kaaba? Uh, verse 26 to 29, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us once again the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, makan uh, al-bayt, Allah tushrika bi shay'a, wa tahir bayti al-ta'ifin, until the end, where Allah calls Ibrahim alayhi salam to purify his home from all of the idols. The previous surah, Ibrahim alayhi salam was making an argument to his people about why the idols do you no good. Here, Ibrahim is purifying the house in Mecca and removing the idols. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Publicly proclaim, call out for hajj and people will come to you from all over the world on the backs of all sorts of animals, speaking all sorts of language, chanting, here we are, oh Allah, here we are. And think about the Muslims in Medina for the very first time can't go to Mecca. And this is what Allah reveals to them. Subhanallah. That, Ibra you know, this image of Ibrahim calling from an empty Mecca, and one day the people will come back responding to you. It's not now that all these people will come saying, labayk Allahumma labayk, but one day they will come. And now these Muslims in Medina are, are sitting there and this is what they're hearing on the mouth of their Prophet ﷺ, the image of Ibrahim ﷺ calling out for people to come and to do hajj. And so that tells them that one day you too will return to this home and it will be purified, responding to the call of your father Ibrahim ﷺ. So inshallah ta'ala on that, I will go ahead and pass it off to Shaykh Abdullah. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa la amma ba'd. Jazakumullah khairan for that beautiful message. Uh, what's important here, uh, subhanAllah, you know, what makes the companions the companions, and subhanAllah, what made the munafiqun the munafiqun, what made the hypocrites the hypocrites, is that their worship was, or their obedience, or their apparent allegiance uh, was ultimately conditional. We should look at ourselves and ask ourselves, is our worship to Allah, our gratitude towards Allah, conditional? Meaning that if I get what I want or I feel that I'll, I deserve, I'll give you what you want. That's very important for us to look at and evaluate ourselves. This is part of our evaluation that we should make on a nightly basis. I mean, even on a, when we make our salawats, it's time for you to evaluate the actions previous to ask Allah from his names and attributes depending on the subject matter. So if, for instance, you're making salat to the Lord and you made a mistake in Fajr or from that time, you say, oh, oh, you know, you say, call his name and ask him to forgive you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the verse number 11 in the chapter of Hajj, a beautiful, beautiful verse that speaks about, uh, you know, what some scholars would mention the munafiqun or the, 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 the hypocrites or the, or the uh, disbelievers. And some would say, okay, we make an analogy off of those that have weak faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this beautiful verse. And what I want you to do when I recite it is to, Ask yourself the question. Be self-accountable as soon as hearing this verse. Allah says, after Adam and Allah, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ حَرْفِ فَإِنْ أَصَابَهُ خَيْرًا تَمَأَنَّ بِهِ وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ فِتْنَةٌ يَنْقَلَبَ عَلَىٰ وَجْهِ خَسِرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةَ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْخُسْرَانُ الْمُبِينَ Verse number 11. Allah says, and from mankind, 
there are people that worship Allah on a, by on an edge. They're on the brinks of something. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firstly says, Wamina nasi from mankind, not everyone, but there's some people. Ya'budullah, they worship Allah on the brink or on the edge. And he says, ala harf. And harf in Arabic, as we know, means letter. And when they use the word letter, because a letter, when you take a letter out of a word, yus, yus, ma'na. Yani the meaning of the word is changed or it is compromised. So it is on the, the edge of the meaning, if you will, because when you take that letter off, it changes its state. It's something totally different, whether not having a meaning or a totally different meaning. So when you are on the brinks of worshiping Allah, or you're only worshiping Allah just a little, and some small tribulation will take you off of that track, right? Maybe a family member, maybe, let's be totally honest, maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend, maybe a husband or a wife, you know, that person that influenced you, mashallah. But then the final frontier comes if Allah takes that person away from you, whether it's taking their life or it's taking them away from you because of something that may have happened. It's a test for you now. It's a test for you because Allah has given the example. There are people that worship Allah based on the edge. And then he gives a tafsir and an explanation of this harf or this type of person. If good was to afflict them, then they are good. They're fine. Oh, yes, this is what I deserve. You know, Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu wa anabihi, may Allah have mercy on him and his father. He mentioned, this is in Al-Bukhari, that you know, there were the A'rab. The A'rab would come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The A'rab were the Bedouins. And when we say the Bedouins, these were the people that were, we say roughly, uh, you know, people that were in the valley, that were in the distant places, not in civilization. And some would say nomads because they would travel from one place to another place in search of food. And as soon as they get it, they keep going. The disadvantage of this is because there's no civilization and there is ghilva. There is roughness. They're rough people because they're not around a lot of people. They're not in a society or a civilized area. So when they would come, as we know, the Prophet Sallam, that one of them grabbed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, and, 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 the, and you know, the Prophet Sallam was very, very nice to him even after he grabbed him. And that was something that he was used to. So these Bedouins, this is, this is what they would do when they would come and they would embrace Islam. When they would go back to their area and they saw that their camels had babies and, you know, mashallah, the families were pregnant. They would say, had that deen on Saleh. This is a good religion. Yes, I knew it. But if something, when they came back and there was no rain, there was famine, they would curse the religion. So when looking at this, it was conditional. It was based on a maslaha. It was based on a worldly benefit, something that they wanted. Because he says, if they were afflicted, asaba, and isaba means yani, something that affects you outwardly and inwardly. If it was khair, any khair, and that's why he uses the indefinite, khairun, itma an nabi, he or she would be fine. What in asabat hu fitna tunin qalaba ala wajhi. But if they were people that were afflicted or tested, for lack of better words, with an affliction, fitna, a trial, in qalaba, and in qalaba means like to flip or to turn. That's where we get the word qalb from because the heart. As some scholars mentioned, turns, you know, from good to evil, you know, from happy to sad, etc. In qalaba ala wajhi, they would throw their hands up. Oh, man, I, I can't deal with this. It's the religion. The religion is the problem. When they say that, that's when they're worshiping Allah on the brink. Because when that bad thing happens to them, quote unquote, they can't take it. They don't hold on. Because it was based on something other than a strong foundation. Knowing Allah and loving Allah. You know, to know him is to love him, right? MashaAllah. You know, when they, when they have that foundation, when, not if, but when these trials come, are they worshiping on a harf? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for those types of people, khasira dunya wal akhirah. They lost in this life and in the next. And remember, a loss in this life, we don't only look at the tangible. They may have a car, they may have gotten into school, gotten into this program, so on and so forth. No, it's much deeper than that. As we mentioned earlier, it's an internal experience and exercise that must be exercised on a consistent basis to make sure that the external is sound, regardless of what you see in most cases. So what we have to understand is that this ayah is calling for self-reflection. Am I an individual that worships Allah conditionally? 
on what I think with my limited intellect is right or wrong or what I deserve. And this is what we should ask ourselves in our dua. If our dua doesn't get, get answered, how do we act? Because if we are those that when we are afflicted with a trial or tribulation, we give up. That is not an example of the believer. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is always open for us to turn back before he takes our soul. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us and make us of those that strive for his mercy and not to make us of those that worship upon him, worship him based on an edge or upon a harf. Radical off you. Zakmullah khair. And subhanAllah, I should mention actually one of the things that I wanted to mention. It's a powerful note as you're reading through Surah Al Hajj in particular. It's the only surah in the Quran with two sajdas, with two prostrations. And uh, it has such a stark difference, the first part being Mecca and then the second part being in Medina. So it's like there are two different realms, two different worlds that this is speaking to. And, uh, you know, it's something really to think about. Sujood in all situations. You prostrate in good and you prostrate in hardship. You prostrate in Mecca when you're fearing for your life. You prostrate in Medina when you're starting all over. You prostrate and you do sajda and patience, sajda and gratitude. And that's the example of Ibrahim al Islam that everything drives him back to such that, right? He gets dro driven back to prostration no matter what. And these people, on the other hand, are driven off the cliff. They jump off the cliff. As soon as something bad happens, we can't do this. And of course, as we mentioned, some Muslims in Mecca held back. They didn't make the hijrah. They said, this is too much. We didn't sign up for this. And unfortunately, they missed out. So inshallah ta'ala, we'll now have Sister Tasneem uh, reflect on, on a portion of inshallah. Assalamualaikum everyone. Um, it, these uh, surahs today are, are particularly difficult um, to reflect on because of the sort of the severity of what they discuss. Now, uh, both Surah al anbiya and Surah Al-Hajj start with this reminder of not the day of judgment, but that moment right before the day of judgment. So as Shukh said, right, Surah al anbiya begins, اقترَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ That this, this moment, this day of reckoning, this day that we're going to be held accountable is getting close to the people. But yet, despite the fact that it's getting close, they're in this, this state of heedlessness. And the ayah that comes right after it, no matter what no sign, what miracle, what is thrown in their face, there's nothing that will wake them up from this ghafla this heedlessness, and they're described as what? وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ they're, they're playing. They're literally just messing around. And you see in Surah Al-Hajj how it starts off with, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ اتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمْ O people, fear your Lord. Now, a lot of times, this concept of ghafla, of heedlessness, is, is uh, contrasted with taqwa, the state of constantly being aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowing that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hearing what I'm doing in every action that you do in order to, you know, seek to perfect, perfect that action. The exact opposite of being heedless, of forgetting that Allah is watching and Allah is always there. Surah so Al-Hajj, the first ayat, Ya ayu nasu taqwa rabbakum, fear your lords, inna zalzalata sa'ati shay'un azim. That, again, not, not the sa'a itself, not the day of judgment itself, but the zalzalati sa'a. Zalzala, the Arabic word, for example, for earthquake is zilzad, right? Zalzada is this, this sort of like this rumbling before the day of judgment. Those, the, 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 the rumbling before the storm. It's coming close. It's there. Things are starting to get shaky. You can almost, you know, you can feel it. It's getting so close, that moment of reckoning. And in going back to Surah Al-Anbiya, so you have both of these surahs that, that really emphasize the day of judgment. Now, going back to Surah Al-Anbiya um, are, are honestly some of the most terrifying ayat to me, for me in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا أَحَسُّوا بَأْسَنَا Right when they sensed, like has, they could feel it coming, the, our punishment, they could feel it coming. فَلَمَّا أَحَسُّوا بَأْسَنَا إِذَا, منهم, إذا منها يركضون, That they bolt. This, they, it, they didn't, the day of judgment is not even here. They could just feel Feel, they know it's again, you see, it's like seeing those dark clouds on a, sto on, a, on a stormy day. They know it's about to come. They're running. And of course, at this point, they know what's happening, where this is coming from, right? This is not that this is something is off and now we're just going to run. They know it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They know the punishment is here and they're running and they know they have nowhere to run. 
but because the fear is so immense, they don't care and they're running. What, 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 what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in response to that? لا تركضوا. Don't run. There's no, there's no place for you to go at this point. لا تركضوا. وارجعوا إلى ما أترفتم فيه. Don't run. In fact, come back to everything you have been blessed with. Come back to, to everything you were neglectful of. All of this blessing upon best blessing. All of these blessings you were drowning in. Your glorious homes. The shelter that I provided over your house. Come back to it. Because you're going to be asked about everything that you were, you, you were given. Everything that you experienced. Because what are you doing this whole time? We're playing around. We're, you know, we're, we're in the state of heedlessness. We're, we're just living our lives. Going to the movies. We're binge watching shows. We're hanging out. Forgetting Salah as we're hanging out with friends. It, it, it's, it's incredible how long we can go in a state of not even realizing fine. You know, not realizing, to, you know, doing basic things, remembering also in your in, in, in your day-to-day -day actions. But to the point where it's, you're being, you're, we're drowning in blessings. There's so much that we have. And even then we're still, we're still heedless. And, and what's terrifying really, the, 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 the goes on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't bother running. In fact, come back so you can be asked about everything I've, been, I've given you. What do they say in response? Ya waylana, qalu ya wayla inna kunna zalimeen. Like, oh, like, I mean, oh, woe to us is the literal translation, but it's like literally you grasping your head and thinking, what have I done? Like, we were wrong. And, and that, 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 that feeling of just being so terrified that what, what, like everything just hitting you like a, like a ton of, a ton of bricks. We were wrong. Honestly, most, some of the most terrifying ayats in the Quran. They kept repeating that over and over and over again. What, what were we thinking? What were we thinking until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wipes them out? Now, I know uh, the times that we're going through, the times that we're experiencing, we're all trying to be optimistic. We're trying to be positive, think about the good. But I particularly wanted to focus on something that is really terrifying to me in light of the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Because it's also important to really push ourselves with this fear of having wronged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having, having been neglectful. And hopefully that that fear pushes us to, to, to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these last 10 nights that are just around the corner. To, to not allow us to be among these people and to make us of the, the muttaqeen. And, and just very briefly, uh, I, th I think that this reality, these ayat speak so much, they speak volumes in comparison to what we're experiencing right now. Because we've, we're experiencing a worldwide pandemic, right? You go out, people are staying their distances, there's things barred up, places are deserted. You go on every news website, every blog, what is it being described as? It's like the end of times, right? It's like the, you know, that's it, the world is over. Every time you get that sense of fear, every time you walk out and you feel like this is creepy, this feels like this is weird, this is uncomfortable, this is not normal, I want you to think about these ayat. And I want you to think about that sensation, that, that fear that you, you kind of feel. Think about the, the thousand times, the million times fold of that, that fear that you will sense when the, that zalzara, that rumbling of the day of judgment is there. Really grasp, don't run from that sensation because that's exactly what we're doing now. What happens? We, we get, we're, we're nervous, we're scared. This is not normal. I'm not comfortable, right? And we're barely sensing anything. So what do we do? We run. How do we run? We run to our devices. We run to do anything to keep our minds from thinking about this reality, right? We, we, anything to, to numb our minds. I'm just gonna binge watch shows. I'm just gonna scroll on Facebook all day. I'm gonna do whatever it takes to maintain that state of heedlessness, of ghafla. I'm gonna play around. I'm gonna mess around just so I don't come to terms with the reality that this sensation is terrifying. It should be terrifying, but don't run. Don't run and, and, and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns these people, these people of doing, that thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these blessings. 
be conscious of his presence. And, and in these, especially in these last 10 nights, turn back to him, do every, run towards him and make, make dua, beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're not among these people and that, we're, that we always, always remain in a state of consciousness. I'm sorry if, uh, if I, um, I, I, I pushed anyone, but these ayat terrify me in, in, a, in, a, in a way that hopefully will push you and I to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy and remain among the mutaqeen. I mean. Jazakumallah khairan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Uh, it's important for us, I think, to always, uh, you know, we have to make sure that we don't lean just in one direction of hope without the direction of fear sometimes, right? And so I think it's important, you know, Allah Azza wa would not give us these scenes unless there was some sort of reflection in them for us. And of course, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only runs us back to him, right? And that's actually the point uh, that in this world, when you have that sensation, when you have that those terrifying sights that are given to you, you have an opportunity to turn back to him and to have complete safety in turning back to him. And the hereafter, when you run away, uh, where are you gonna run? And so, uh, you know, what, what came to my mind as you were speaking, uh, hadith of the Prophet there is no refuge or shelter from you except to you. Uh, I can't escape Allah except by going back to Allah. I can't shelter myself or seek refuge from him except to him. And so uh, he doesn't give us these ayat to paralyze us with fear. He gives us these ayat to activate us with fear. And fear is an important part of our faith. Uh, not, a, not, not a debilitating fear, but uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and forgive us. May Allah azza wa jal allow us to have safety on that day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be um, awake and, and mindful in this world and to be uh, comforted by that mindfulness in the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not allow us to, uh, to drown away when he sends us such a reminder to drown ourselves away into heedlessness. And subhanAllah, what you're thinking, you know, one thing that you touched on, all of these devices uh, provide added means of ghafla as well, of heedlessness as well, right? So where were you going to run in the past? You know, now it's much easier to find something to distract you. Uh, but at the same time, what we're seeing as well is that alhamdulillah, all of these devices, if used properly, like everything else in life, also can help us connect further with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that they can keep us reminded inshallah. But um, uh, I would encourage everyone to take what uh, Sister Tasneem shared with us tonight and to uh, to bring it with you to your your salah and your qiyam, and be the night time if we can all push ourselves to a moment of of, of weeping, to a moment of crying. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that there are two eyes that would never be touched by the fire, and one of them is an eye that remembered Allah subhanahu wa taala in privacy, and then was filled uh, due to that fear of Allah subhanahu wa taala was then filled with. Uh, with tears. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our hearts are softened and that our eyes are wet with tears and that our tongues are moist with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these 10 nights and that uh, we are amongst those Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you are forgiving and you love to pardon so we ask you to pardon us. Uh, I just want to give one last word Sheikh Abdullah. Uh, I know you, I saw you reflecting as well on the very deep words that were shared tonight so if you have anything you'd like to share. Oh, no, 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 mashallah, you shared, you shared enough, man, out there. I think that's, uh, it's really just being aware, self-aware of what's going on. And um, just like you mentioned, you know, and how she mentioned these devices can be a means. You just have to know how to use that to where it's a ni'mah as opposed to a hujja alayna. You know, it's a hujja alayna, inshallah. An argument for us, not an argument against us. Barakallah fikum. Jazakumullah khair, Sister Tasneem, for joining us. And Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh Abdullah, as always. Inshallah, we'll see you all tomorrow night. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.